Hello and welcome to this AGU presentation on key regional factors governing megathrust earthquakes, subduction mechanics and tsunami genesis. My name is Alice Gabriel and this is work conducted together with Thomas Ulrich and Betsy Madden during their PhD and postdoc respectively at LME Munich. Earthquake dynamic rupture modeling is physics-based but requires initial conditions that we can constrain from um, a variety of geophysical data. For example, we need information from geology that can be given in the form of high resolution topography of bathymetry and um, complex 3D images of the subsurface. We need to rely on laboratory experiments telling us how the friction response of faults is during earthquake rupture propagation. And we need to prescribe the loading and the strength of the faults along which earthquakes propagate in our models. We are integrating these different observational constraints into a computational model in which we solve for frictional failure across the prescribed fault surfaces and seismic wave propagation can generate uh, also a wide range of synthetic outputs, for example, synthetic seismograms, synthetic geodetic time series, but also sea, first sea surface displacements that can be used to initiate tsunami models and rupture dynamics and everything that happens on the faults and informs us in terms of earthquake physics. These models can be empowered by supercomputing. In Munich, we've been developing um, an open source earthquake and seismic wave propagation modeling tool called SISOL, which is specifically suitable in handling geometric complexity, multiphysics, and highly varying element sizes. Here's an example shown of um, seismic wave field interacting with the strong topography of a volcano. We've been scaling this method up to full supercomputers so-called hero runs, or something I call hero runs. Here's an example of a simulation of the 1992 Landers earthquake, the rupture connecting dynamically all of these fault segments and radiating seismic waves that we resolve up to 10 Hertz, which was run on the full super MOOC computer in Munich in 2014. We've been porting these methods to the scales of mega thrust earthquakes uh, using a couple of methodological developments, including a geoinformation server for efficient input and output, and um, a method called local time stepping, which allows us to um, account for this hugely varying element sizes in these problems. We can use these methods now to identify key factors controlling megathrust earthquakes and tsunami dynamics. When we're doing so, we're facing two challenges. The first one is that physics-based modeling on these scales um, requires very large and long simulations, which have to acknowledge um, not only the large spatial temporal time scales, but also the geometric complexity inherent to the problem. This is now feasible and requires not full supercomputers, but a um, few thousands of CPU houses, which is well in the range of a typical um, supercomputing allocation or an institute cluster. The second challenge, however, is that it's still difficult to constrain the required modeling initial conditions and also to verify the modeling outcomes. Today, I want to show that we can identify stress, rigidity, and sediment strength as key regional controlling factors for megatrust earthquake and tsunami dynamics. And for doing so, we are able to constrain the required initial conditions from observations. The 2004 Sumatranam and earthquake in Indian Ocean tsunami was sparsely and asymmetrically covered in terms of observations, but also provides a um, huge variety of global recordings and um, a variety of data used for source inferences. These data-driven kinematic earthquake models vary. And uh, if they're used to source a tsunami model, as is shown in this picture um, here, where we have different uh, kinematic data-driven earthquake source inversions being used to source tsunami models, um, they <coughs> vary in agreement matching satellite or inundation records. So here's an agreement with satellite records, here's an agreement with inundation records. And here are just uh, striking differences in the C4 displacement of using these different earthquake sources. The event also challenged the ideas on key factors controlling the occurrence of large mega thrust events that were being identified as convergence rates, slab fall, and the age of the oceanic lithosphere controlling um, these events, since it occurred on a comparably slowly converging and middle-aged plate. In building a dynamic rupture model on this scale, we first construct a 3D megatrust and splay fault um, geometry and structural model. For this, we are prescribing a curved um, slab, which is intersecting with splay faults on local bathymetry. We omit smaller scale geometry and heterogeneities or asperities. 
And we include a very shallowly dipping thrust faults playing from the slab interface within the accretion and wedge that merged with the high resolution bathymetry, allowing for potential um, rupture all the way uh, to the trench. We also prescribing the logical structure in terms of a 3D subsurface velocity model adapted from Quest 1.0 and local tomography. Importantly, we assume a lower velocity subduction channel in which the mega thrust fault is embedded, which um, is characterized by very strong rigidity variations accounting for the presence of near trench sediments. We are also accounting for off-fault plastic deformation by coupling bulk cohesion to effective vertical stresses um, as, as is done in the rupture dynamics community. The principal stress orientation can be constrained from stress inversion combined with geodetic observations on faulting mechanisms. We allow a non Andersonian initial stress field, we allow for a plunge of the uh, maximum compressive stress, and we align the stress inversion and geodetic observations by choosing SH max orientation um, and accounting for the inferred clockwise rotation to resemble um, observations. On the plot here, we see in blue um, the SH max trends in this study compared to um, the one inferred by Hardebeck in 2012. And we can see this rotation of the SH max direction um, along arc. The principal stress magnitudes or the deviatoric stresses um, are modulated, so they're not constant. And uh, this is illustrated by a ratio that is given as the R ratio. And this is the relative strength of the mega thrust and of display faults. The strength of a virtual optimally oriented fault plane would be given by R0 that ranges from 0 0.45 to 0 0.65. And this modulation resembles the long arc variations and convergence rate that we take from Euler pole um, inferences. The absolute variations in pre-stress magnitude are small. Um, we show here um, shear over effect of normal stress. You can see there's very little variation. And, um, the subduction interface is nearly a long arc, and the subduction interface is nearly always optimally oriented. We also accounting for overpressurized fault fluids. We assume um, a near little static fluid pressure to ensure a realistic stress drop. The resulting effective confining stress increase with depth is here following a gradient of one megapascal kilometers. Um, the effect of overpressurized fault fluids is further discussed in compa companion talk by Betsy Madden, S4207. Frictional fault strength can be constrained by um, the significant principal um, co-seismic stress rotation that was observed during this event. We can infer from this that the pre-stress and the stress drop are of similar magnitude. Uh, if we're assuming a simple linear slip weakening friction law as we do here, and we fix the static frictional strength to be high, statically strong interfaces, um, we can infer uh, the dynamic friction coefficient um, following a very simple relationship which includes R0, the relative fault strength, which we already constrained from observations and the fluid pressure, which we also constrained um, in this manner. And uh, this leads to a very low dynamic friction coefficient for this friction law, which is ranging between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 in this model. We also assume a large um, critical slip weakening distance, 2.5 meters, which leads to a wide process zone and together with geometrical effects to a wide slip pulse propagating along the arc. And we do need to account for this large uh, Frictional, uh, friction energy to capture the spontaneous arrest stopping of rupture um, in the north, as well as an average rupture speed compared to the published inferences. We note that DC um, increases linearly uh, from a very small value within the rupture initiation process to capture hierarchical rupture growth during nucleation. This is the preferred model. We see here um, slip rate of the earthquake as it propagates from um, from south to north. We can see that the slip rate takes the form of a boomerang shape. It's a slower rupture um, close to the trench and um, at the seismogenic depth. And we also see multiple rupture forms, so complex, complex um, rupture evolving due to the geometric complexities. We also um, see that all of display faults are dynamically activated independent of the orientation, but they host um, a factor of 10 less slip. We can translate these dynamic rupture models into moment tensor representations here in blue, co can compare this to observations. We can also translate that in a five point moment tensor representation, which is also nicely aligning with observations. Further observational verification can be achieved by looking at ground deformation. I show here in blue synthetic ground displacements and an orange 
um, geodetic observations in the horizontal and the vertical components. Interesting is in the um, vertical components that we can see the imprint here of display faults um, due to the steep orientation. Uh, even though they have less slip, they do imprint in the vertical uplift. This really nice match can be to uh, for a forward model, it's not an inversion, can be to first order explained by the modulations that we prescribe due to the convergence rate variation uh, along arc and the geometry of the slab and display faults. We can then look at the fault slip of this model compared to observational kinematic inferred um, fault slip. And we can see that even though we omit small scale heterogeneities, we do see dynamic along arc variations in terms of um, slip segmentation. We see these patches evolving, thinning of rupture depth towards the north. Um, and we also discuss later, uh, we can also see that regions that have high offfall yielding of the sediments reduces shallow fault slip and increase the uplift of the trench, whereas regions where we have less offfall yielding promotes or slip all the way to the trench. If you're comparing to teleseismic and acoustics, we can um, compare the synthetic moment rate release measured on the fault to um, observational occurrences from teleseismics. And we can also look at rupture speed in this model in the plaque line here compared to observational findings from Bailey waves and acoustic observations, we also see good um, agreement. In this plot, I show a comparison of teleseismics. In this case, they are generated with a very simple um, global seismic wave propagation tool. Um, what's interesting about this is that we have two synthetics here in red and in blue um, compared to observed black teleseismic waveforms. And um, the red and the blue scenario, they vary um, in the amount of slip to the trench versus off fault yielding of sediments. However, they have indistinguishing synthetics in the teleseismics here. And the same is true if you're looking at the geodetic near field um, comparison that I showed before, we cannot distinguish. This motivated us to also take tsunami data into account by linking these large scale dynamic rupture models to tsunami models. And we use an open source linkage workflows, uh, which includes filtering of time dependent displacements how to uh, properly treat seismic surface waves, um, specif specifies the required spatial resolution and much more. By doing that, um, we can show here three scenarios, the one that I discussed before, and one scenario with stronger sediments or weaker sediments. We see this large variation and slip to the trench increased with stronger sediments up to 60 meters and basically non-existent um, in a model of weaker sediments. Um, however, traded off by this large off-fault um, yielding of the sedimentary um, material. And if you're linking all of these three dynamic rupture scenarios to tsunami models, which I um, snapshotted here, uh, we can see a huge variation in the fit to um, the satellite data, which is in blue. Um, and the weaker sediment scenario here overshoots observations dramatically. And the stronger sediment scenario is not capturing all details, especially of the first two double peaks that are very interesting in this, in this uh, recording. I want to finish this presentation with an outlook. We're working on 3D fully coupled earthquake tsunami modeling together um, with the group of Eric Dunham, especially with Lauren Abrahams, and, uh, who is also a talk at AGU. Uh, so this is an idea which has been uh, developed in 2D and both in the tsunami and in the dynamic rupture community to simultaneously model uh, dynamic rupture, seismic wave propagation, acoustic wave propagation, and gravity waves, tsunami waves. And um, what I show on the top here and here is a model where we do this in 3D using Sysol um, for the Palo Sulawesi localized tsunami. And uh, let me play this video again. We see is um, strike slip event going super sheer. You see the um, super sheer Macron developing. Um, and then we see later on the tsunami wave being generated by these waves in Palo Bay. In summary, I showed that we can identify regional key factors, stress, rigidity, and the strength of sediments, governing megatrust earthquakes and tsunami genesis in data constrained forward models. These large scale models of the 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake and Indian Ocean tsunami reconcile near and far field seismic, geodetic, geological, and tsunami observations. Our approach allows to constrain initial conditions. Uh, in this case, we find a non Andersonian pre stress with pronounced along arc variations, pronounced depth dependent variations in rigidity, near lithostatic fluid pressure that results in low effective normal stresses, and strong frictional weakening and sediments of relatively high yield strength being required 
to um, reconcile all observations, all independent observations. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I would like to highlight um, that this is uh, research which is submitted and there's a preprint at hosted at Earth Archive. And uh, if you have any questions, please contact me um, via email or via Twitter. And for related work, please visit my research website. Thank you. <laughs>